Hello, so this is a video response to a really wonderful number file video I saw today about the dice game pig. So this is a dice game where you push your luck by rolling a dice, and if you ever roll a one, you sort of lose everything and go back to zero. Um, and the question is, how far should you push your luck? And in the video, they did a Monte Carlo simulation, and they also did a, an exact solution. And they said that the exact solution is sort of difficult to run. It takes a long time to run. And I have a solution I think that is m quite a bit quicker. So uh, this is my Python implementation. There's some math at the top where I explain what I'm doing. This is the Python code. It's like 10 lines or something. And this is how it runs on the first 40 samples. So if you run it up to uh, size 40, uh, you get the same graph they did in the number file video, but it's quite a bit quicker. So I wanted to explain my point of view and, and show you how the code works and that kind of thing. Uh, I also have the Google Colab. It's, a, it's shared, so you can go and read the code yourself if you want. Um, but I thought I'd give you my point of view on, on how this stuff works. So uh, to start, I'll, I'll summarize the rules. So in the game of Pig, it's a push your luck dice game. You start at zero points. Every turn you roll a dice. If you roll a two, three, four, five, or six, that gets added on to your total. If you roll a one, you lose all of your points and you lose the game, you get zero points. And the question is, how often should you uh, roll? So you can stop rolling after any time you want. And if you uh, stop, you just collect the points you have so far and you can walk away with that. But should you keep going? And a common strategy they discussed in the uh, number file video is to choose a goal line S and you stop if you reach S or above and otherwise you keep rolling. And the question is, what is the optimal value of S? And uh, so that's what they were discussing. And so for a fixed value of S, you can run this thing. And the way I have, uh, I'm gonna set it up mathematically. I'm gonna define a sequence of random variables, X0, X1, X2, and so on. That is the sequence of how many points you have so far as you're playing the game. And to give you an example, I'm going to run through an example here. So I have some uh, dice rolls that I downloaded from Wolfram Alpha. And I'm going to pretend that these are the dice rolls that came up. And I'm going to tell you the values of uh, these random variables x0, x1, x2, and so on. So in this situation, uh, x0 is your first roll. You roll the 3, so x0 is 3. x1, you decide to keep going because you're at less than uh, 20 points let's say, so let's say we're going to stop at uh, s equals 20. So if you stop at s equals 20, since you only have three points, you decide to keep going. So x1 is what you get when you roll again. And you rolled again, you got a six this time. So now your x1 is nine. Uh, nine is still less than 20. So you decide to keep going. So this time x2 is uh, nine plus six, which is 15. Uh, 15 is still less than 20. So you decide to keep going. You roll again. And this time you got a one. So x3 is zero because you got a one. And this is how I keep track of how the game is progressing is through these random variables, x0, x1, x2, x3. Uh, here, let's do another example. Uh, in this one, uh, the dice roll came out a three. So x0 is three again. Uh, x1 is now eight. You keep going. x2 is 10. You keep going some more. x3 is 15. You roll one more time, you get x4 is 19. Uh, you roll one more time, x5 is 21. And now you stop because you are above 20 and you decided before you started that you would stop um, at the goal line s equals 20. So that's how I'm keeping track of the, the uh, outcomes of the game and how it's progressing. Uh, so those, that's my definition of the, the sequence of random variables. And I'm going to think of it as a sequence that goes for all times t. So in the example I gave, I stopped after some point. But you can just imagine that t goes on and on forever and ever by just saying after the game stops, the value of xt doesn't change. So in the two examples I gave, uh, x3 was 0, and x4 is also 0, x5 is also 0. You just get zeros forever and ever in the sequence. Uh, so for all times t, xt is 0 because you lost the game. In this example, xt is always 21. So x6 is 21, x7 is 21, and it just is always 21. OK, why would I do this such a tortured thing? Why do I have this uh, silly system? And the reason I'm doing it is because if you do it this way, the sequence, the sequence xt, it's a sequence of random variables, it's something called a Markov chain. And a Markov chain just means that xt depends only on xt minus 1. And Markov chains are really nice. Uh, they have this simple dependence where to figure out what happens at time t, you only need to know what happened at time t minus 1. And you can solve them basically with linear algebra. So if you know the rules for what happened at time t minus 1, you can solve and figure out what happens at time t. And by iterating this, you can get the whole picture. And I, I suspect this is a little bit easier than uh, what was being done in the number file video. So to show you how these uh, rules work, 
I made a little grid over here. And what I'm going to do is instead of keeping track of a particular sequence of random variables, so some outcome of the dice, I'm instead going to do sort of all the possible dice rolls all at once. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of the function, which it has two inputs, it has an x and a t. So I'm keeping track of x on the uh, y-axis over here and t on the x-axis. And I'm going to look at the function that is the probability that the random variable xt equals x. So there's two inputs because there's a time, there's a time t and there's a space x. And we're looking at what is the probability you are at x at time t. And the key thing, the thing that makes the whole, that drives the whole bus, that makes everything work nicely, the probability that xt equals x, it depends on the probability that xt minus 1 equals y. So if you know what happens at the previous time t minus 1, you can figure out what happens at, times t, at time t. And you don't need anything else. So you only need what happened at time t minus 1, and you can figure it all out. So let me show you uh, what I mean in this grid. I'm going to start filling out the values of the probability that xt equals x. So in the zeroth roll, in your very first roll that happens in this game, uh, you've rolled the dice, and you have a 1 6 chance of getting a 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, and you have a 1 6 chance of rolling a 1. If you roll a 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, you're just at 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So the probabilities here are 1 6, 1 6, 1 6, 1 6, 1 6. And the probability to be at 0 is also a 6, because if you roll a 1, you automatically go to 0, you lose the game forever. And so here's the thing. Uh, when we're we're going to figure out now what happens in the first column at t equals 1. And to figure out what happens in the first column, we're going to only use the information in the column directly to the left. So by looking at the column t equals 0, we can figure out what happens in the column t equals 1. Um, OK, so the way it works is like this. Uh, to figure out what happens in a particular square, you look at all the possible ways you could have gotten to that square. So to get to x equals 4 and t equals 1, where could you have come from? You could have only come from uh, this square. You could have only come from t equals 0, x equals 1. And that happens with probability 1 6, assuming you are at this point. So the value that will go here is going to be a 6 times a 6, which is 1 out of 36. That's the probability to be at x equals 4 at time t equals 1. OK, what about this one? What's the probability be at uh, x equals 5 at time t equals 1? Uh, so same kind of situation, but now there's two ways you could have gotten there. You could have gotten there from here or from here. So you could have rolled a 2 in the first situation. You could have been at 2 and then rolled a 3, or you could have been at 3 and rolled a 2. And uh, if you add those up, you get the probability is 2 out of 36. OK, and you, you can keep doing this. So this one's going to be 3 out of 36. This one's going to be 4 out of 36, and so on. And the key is that we only need the numbers in the left column. If you know the numbers in the left column, there's a rule that takes you by summing and doing these things and looking at where you were and where you what you rolled uh, to take you to the next column. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that if you look at the value down here, uh, how could you have gotten to x equals 0 at time t equals 1? Well, this time there are many ways. So one way is you could have come from this spot. You could have been at 0 and you just stayed at 0. So that gives a probability of 1 sixth. But there is another way you could have gotten there, and that is you could have rolled a 1 from any of these spots. So these spots, all of them potentially lead to the spot x equals 0. And so you get a, a plus uh, 5 over 6 times 1 over 6 here. And that adds up to 11 out of 36. So this number will be 11 out of 36 here. Oh, oh, I've deleted the column. 11 out of 36. So by iterating in this way, you can figure out this function, the probability that xt equals x. You can sort of have the computer figure it out column by column. So first you figure out t equals 0. Then you use that to figure out t equals 1. You use that to figure out t equals 2, and so on. And that's exactly what the computer program does. So if you understood like very roughly what I was doing there, um, the computer program is not hard to figure out. Uh, so let me show you how it works. And so indeed, if you run it uh, once, here I, I had it calculate it with the rule uh, stopping at 10. And this is the, the board you get. And we calculated by hand the first two columns. So the first column here says 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6. And then the next column, this number is 0 0.3056. That's 11 out of 36. And these are the probabilities to be at these various spots. And there really are three simple rules. So you can read. Um, what I've written here in the Google Colab uh, to figure out exactly. There's three rules that tell you how to go from one column to the next column. So one rule is the updates at zero. This was the last thing we did. And it says, how could you have gotten to zero at time t? The only ways are you could have been at time, you could have been at zero at time t minus one, or 
you could have been anywhere else and rolled a one. And rolling one has probability one sixth. So adding that all up, that gives you the probability that xt equals zero. So that's rule number one, updates to the zero state. That tells you the probability xt equals zero. Uh, rule number two tells you how to update states where you're still playing the game. So if uh, x is between one and s, that's s being the target goal you're, you're gonna stop at, then the rule is you look at, you sum over all the possible places that are between two and six points less than where you are. So how could you have gotten to x of t equals x? Well, you could have started at y uh, for any value of y between x minus two and x minus six. So that's essentially what this does. Uh, there's a little max here because you can't go negative, that's not allowed. So th that's just to fix that up. And that happens, each of those happen with probability one sixth, you add them all up. Okay, that's updates to the still playing states. Um, the last thing, oh boy, I've gotten into the code. Okay, here we go. So the last thing you need to do is update states for which you have already exceeded the threshold S. And so how could you have gotten to a state where you exceed the threshold S? Well, you could have already been in that state. So you could have won the game last round and you're just, you're staying still. That's like what happened in um, these later rounds here. So the, the 21, 21, 21, that can happen. Or you could, you could get to that state by going from a, a state that has less than S points to a state that has more than S points. And that's again, the exact same kind of sum as we had in these still playing states in rule two. So there's three rules. How do you update at zero? How do you update states one to S? How do you update states greater than S? And they're all simple sums. Uh, so that's what the program does. And so if you read the code, I think it's pretty readable. I'm doing it all in NumPy, which is convenient. Um, but there really are three lines. I'm There's some initialization. I start the grid out with all zeros basically. I set up the first column. That was the one I did by hand a second ago. Then I loop over all possible T values. And what I do is I apply the three rules. So rule one tells you how to update state zero um, given the information in the previous column. So it depends on P of T minus one. Uh, then I loop over all X's that are in the active playing states and I apply rule two. And rule two is do some sum of the previous states. And then I do rule three, which is do some sum of the previous states. And if you apply all three of these rules, um, you can output a nice grid like this, which is identical to the grid I was doing by hand over here, except now the computer has done it. Uh, lastly, if you want to figure out the expected value that you get um, by doing this, you just have to do this uh, big sum at the end. So by summing over the probabilities, you get the expected value. Uh, so that's this line over here in the Google Colab. Uh, I'll say one more thing. This is kind of a lazy implementation, actually, uh, even though it's, it's quite a bit faster than I think uh, what was going on in the number file video. Uh, because it, I'm doing lots of loops and loops are slow. So a faster way to do this is to encode everything into this matrix M. You can make a big matrix called M and just write that down once, put it in memory, and then the computer can multiply by M very quickly because computers are optimized for that really well. So the way I've done it with a loop is actually not even the best way to do it. So I think doing it with a, a matrix is even better. Um, okay, so what else do I have to say? Uh, yeah, that's the code. I think it's pretty readable. Um, this is, you can make it output the, the matrix that you get. You can look at all the probabilities. Uh, one nice thing is you can read off the probability that you lost the game from this uh, bottom column. So at time t minus one, if t is really big, uh, it's gonna settle down. So you can see that the last two columns are identical and that's because nothing happens. The game is sort of over by that point. Um, so by reading off uh, the value in this corner, you can figure out the probability that you lost the game. In this case, it is a uh, 40%, so not so good. Uh, you're pretty likely to lose the game. Um, and I made it output here, all the possible values between uh, one, stopping at between one and 40. And you can see that indeed that the peak is right around uh, 20. Interestingly, 20 and 21 have the same value, which I thought was cool, I didn't know that. And you get the same kind of plot that you got in the uh, number file video. So I thought I'd put that out there uh, in case somebody finds it useful. I think markup chains are really cool and uh, hopefully you do too. Hello again, so I'm here with one little extra tidbit for you guys. Uh, the reason I was so excited to see this uh, number file video on pig is that I read that pig paper a long time ago, the one where they find the optimal strategies in two player pig. And that inspired me to write this paper, which is on the optimal strategy in the game, guess who? So guess who is a popular kids game. You might've played it. You ask yes or no questions to your opponent. Uh, you get to flip people down. Uh, but unlike pig, which has a kind of nasty analytical solution, you saw those curves in the number file video that go up and down and all over. Uh, guess who has a really satisfying analytical solution? So guess who has this nice solution uh, that looks a lot nicer? And I wanted to say this because uh, when I was working on this project, I also did Monte Carlo solutions for uh, guess who? And then I eventually did this uh, Markov chain thing that you saw in this last video. 
And when I did the Markov chain thing, uh, I had a guess for what I thought this formula would be. And then I took this the guess and I subtracted it from what came out of the uh, Monte Carlo solution. Uh, sorry, not the Monte Carlo solution, the exact Markov chain solution. And the answer turned out to be uh, this this number one. So my guess for what the solution was 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 off by this plus one over here. And I was able to, you know, once I figured that out, I was able to solve it from there. But if I had only ever done the uh, Monte Carlo, I wouldn't I wouldn't have gotten one. I would have gotten one plus like a little random noise, and maybe I would have never figured it out. Um, so that's why I think knowing the uh, Markov chain solution is nice. Uh, this paper has lots of uh, nice pictures. So these are the optimal strategy optimal strategies in Guess Who, and there's some smooth analytical function that tells you how you should play Guess Who. Um, so if people are interested and leave some comments or something, maybe I'll go over this uh, paper sometime.